Please stand and join us in singing, Sing with All the Saints in Glory, number 593, number 593. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And with your spirit. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We continue our journey through this Easter season on this third Sunday, and once again we hear a story of Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection, bringing with him the gift of peace. So let us ask the Lord to gift us with that same peace which we can experience through the forgiveness of our sins. Lord Jesus, you came to gather the nations into the peace of God's kingdom. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you come to us this morning to strengthen us in holiness. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you will come again with glory and salvation for your people. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Father, may your people exult forever in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward with confident hope to the rejoicing on the day of the resurrection. To our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen invite our boys and girls now to come forward for their liturgy of the word.
right. How are you guys doing? Good? Everything's good in school? All right. Come on in, you guys. How many of you have ever got like a cut or a scratch on you? You got a bunch of them. Okay. Uh, what happens to that scratch and the cut eventually? It heals. How does it heal? How does it heal? Yes. Huh? It bleeds a little bit, and then what forms over the cut? A scab, okay. And then when the scab falls off, what's left? Skin. Can you see like where the cut was? Sometimes you can, but eventually it'll go away. You know, if people like have to go to the hospital and they get like a cut or they do surgery, what's left sometimes that people will see? Yes, what was it? A scar. So a scar, if you see somebody has a scar like on their face, let's say, you might ask them, where did that scar come from? And what will they tell you? Oh, I got cut or something. Or if somebody has like a scar on their arm, you say, well, where did that scar come from? They say, oh, I cut myself one time uh, because I was messing with a knife or something. You don't want to do that anyway. Uh, bad example. Okay, so. Now, when Jesus had his wounds, where, where, where did he have his wounds? In his hands and his feet and in his side and on his head. So he died, and then when he came back to life, when he was raised from the dead, what was left? Skin, okay. Scars. What were those scars from? The nails, yes. His wounds, you could still see it. Was it still bloody or anything? No. It was kind of healed, but you could see them. So, you know what? When Jesus came back, they didn't believe it was him. But how did he prove that it was him? He showed them his scars. So, sometimes the scars of Jesus, well, the scars of Jesus identify him. It tells us this is really Jesus. That's how they knew him. Because if those scars and everything had gone away and it was just like this... He would say, well, no. And he goes, no, look. This is what happened to me when they put the nails in my hand and my feet and the spear in my side. It's still there. You could see the scars. So sometimes when we see pictures of Jesus, he'll have those scars, right? Because that tells us that he died. He suffered for us. So scars are not bad things, but they kind of tell you what happened. What happened, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to send you out to make more sense of it, okay? <laughs> Let's bless them. May the word of God strengthen you. May the word of God nourish you. May the word. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter said to the people, The God of Abraham, 
the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you, the author of life you put to death. But God raised him from the dead. Of this, we are witnesses. Now I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he had announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. John. My children, I am writing this to you so that you may not commit sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is expiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. The way we may be sure that we know him is to keep his commandments. Those who say, I know him, but do not keep his commandments are liars and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, the love of God, is truly perfected in him. The word 
of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. The two disciples recounted what had taken place on the way and how Jesus was made known to them in the breaking of bread. While they were still speaking about this, he stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified, and thought that they were seeing a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do questions arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet, while they were still incredulous for joy and were amazed, he asked them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of baked fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. He said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. How many of you think that you might have had an experience seeing a ghost at any time? Anybody here? A few people. Okay, you're brave. Listen, I got a psychiatrist I want you to meet. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. 20% of Americans say that they've seen a ghost. It's always kind of interesting. Part of it, I suspect, is because ghosts kind of inundate literature and movies and things like that. You know, there's a lot of movies and entertainment out there having to do with ghosts. I think Ghostbusters, which is kind of fun kind of thing. But I've seen some other ghost stories and read some that, you know, you don't want to be alone when you're doing that. It's common for a priest or a deacon to have someone request that we come and bless their home because something is not right there. Sometimes, well, most of the time, people will ask for a home to be blessed if it's new. Some cultures do that as a course of practice kind of thing. But there are times when people feel like there's an entity there, or there's something other than themselves, someone. On occasion, they will say, well, you know, we wake up in the morning and things are kind of moved around. Or we found things like on the floor when we wake up. Cabinets are open. Or the dog always seems to be barking at a certain time of the day in the corner there. So 
we will respond to those kinds of things. And we have a ritual blessing that asks God's blessing and protection upon those who are in the home. And there are even prayers calling upon the Lord to expel whatever it is there might be that's maybe not healthy or contrary to the gospel. I had an interesting story one time experience where this family asked me to come and bless their home because they felt there was a ghost there, something that was kind of playful, but moving things around, and they'd find things knocked down on the floor. They'd wake up in the morning. How did that get there? Things like that. So I went, armed with a little holy water and a blessed candle and my prayer book, and went through each room and blessed each room and did all the appropriate prayers. Then uh, they said, hey, let's have something to drink. Sit down. And so I put my holy water bottle on the island, you know, the kitchen island. Went inside the living room, whatever, and sitting, talking. When it came time for me to leave, I went in the kitchen and my holy water bottle was on the floor. I just should have refunded their money right there, I suppose. <laughs> so I thought, you know, did somebody playing a game or something? It was bizarre. And I never went there again after that. <laughs> There are a lot of people who are skeptical about these kinds of things. I was reading what one psychiatrist wrote. He said, if you tell me you had a burger for lunch, I'll take your word for it. But if you tell me you shared your french fries with Abraham Lincoln's ghost, I'm going to prescribe some meds. <laughs> Catholic Church, the Catholic Church does not have a specific teaching about ghosts and these kinds of things. But we do believe that each person has a spirit or a soul that leaves the body at the moment of death and moves on to heaven, to hell, or to purgatory. We don't quite understand what those things involve. But our church still believes it's good to pray for people who have died, especially if we're uncertain about their faith or the life they lived. We pray for the souls in purgatory, those who may be in need of mercy and forgiveness. So could it be, some people think, that ghosts that people experience might be those souls that are in need of prayer? That's usually the response that we give. So-and-so needs prayers. So-and-so is not at rest. We can't really say, though, what that's about. And there's another thing that I think is important to mention, that ghosts are different from demons. We definitely believe in demons. Fallen angels, evil spirits do exist. They're a manifestation of evil. And the Catechism of the Church warns us not to be overly curious about exploring these things, not to dabble in any kind of supernatural kinds of practices which are opposed to the faith. Now, if you lived at the time of Jesus, you would have had no problem believing in the supernatural. They readily believe there were demons wandering around and ghosts roaming the desert wastelands, ghosts inhabiting bodies of water, common thought. We know Jesus came into personal contact with evil spirits who were possessing people. He demonstrated complete authority over them. We don't have any sense though that Jesus encountered ghosts or somehow disembodied spirits. But there is an interesting story in the Old Testament, the story of King Saul. He wanted to know the outcome of a battle that he was going to wage. So he had some witches conjure up the spirit of a dead prophet, and they were successful. And when the spirit of that dead prophet appeared, that spirit condemned King Saul for calling him up. Now, I share all of this with you because in the gospel today, we hear how Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection. You know, his close friends and his disciples knew that he was killed. They knew that he was buried. Now they're in a room together when suddenly he appears in their midst. 
He greets them by saying, peace be with you. But the effect was just the opposite. They were startled and terrified and were told they thought they were seeing a ghost. This is not the first time that they thought Jesus was a ghost. Remember the story when they were on the Sea of Galilee in the boat and the storm kicked in and they were fearful. So Jesus starts walking on the water towards the boat. And we're told when they saw that, they thought it was a ghost and they cried out, terrified. But he had to reassure them, it is I, do not be afraid. Were the apostles foolish to think that Jesus was a ghost? Not really, because the laws of nature tell us certain things. The laws of nature tell us a person cannot walk on water. The laws of nature tell us you cannot just simply walk through a door without first opening it. And the law of nature tells us that a certifiably dead and buried person is not likely to sit at your table someday and ask for something to eat. But this is what Jesus did. He walked on water. He multiplied loaves and fishes. He was raised from the dead. He appeared to his disciples after they saw him suffer and die and be buried. And then he showed them his hands and his feet, still wounded, as if to say, I'm the same person that you remember. It's really me. And in order to dispel any doubts that they might have had about him being a ghost, he said to them, do you have anything here to eat? Obviously, a ghost or a spirit has no reason to eat. But Jesus did just that. He ate a piece of fish in their presence. Now, some people might think this whole discussion is ridiculous. It's not necessary. Most Christians say, of course Jesus was raised from the dead. This wasn't a trick. He came back from the dead. He was raised. But the fact is, there were some Christians in the early centuries who believed that Jesus was a spirit, that he simply appeared to have a body, kind of like the angels who, when they appeared to people, took human form. Many Christians believe that's what Jesus was. That's who he was some kind of spirit. They thought that Jesus was truly God, but that he was simply using a bodily appearance in his earthly life. And the same Christians thought that Jesus only appeared to have died on the cross. After all, if he's God, God cannot die. So they said, well, the real Jesus kept living. We just saw the human part of him die. But, it wasn't until a few centuries in that the Christian church concluded and taught that Jesus was truly raised body and soul to the new life of the resurrection. He did not come back to the same earthly life. <clears throat> he moved forward. He was transformed. He became something new in his body and spirit. Therefore, Jesus could walk on water. He could pass through the door unopened. He could appear to many different people at the same time, as we are told. And he could do something as human as eat and drink. This is the life of the resurrection. New body, new soul no longer subject to the laws of nature. It is something completely new. Now, why is this truth about the physical resurrection of Jesus important? First, the resurrection of Jesus' body tells us that the human body is good, that our bodies are holy. Too often throughout history, especially in Christianity, there have been those who say just the opposite, that the physical body is bad, it's sinful. There have been strains of thought in Christianity that you should subject your body to punishment, treat it harshly, subdue your passions. It's true that many of our sins are sins of the flesh because temptation 
attacks us where we are weak. And as Jesus said, the flesh is weak. But that doesn't mean that the physical body is bad. It means that Jesus chose to take upon himself a human body. He could have come as simply a spiritual being or an angel, but he didn't. He chose to take flesh. So the goal in the Christian life is to bring the body and soul together in harmony. We should not be punishing our bodies, but we should care for them and treat them with respect. That is why we're also taught to respect not only our own bodies, but the bodies of other people, the unborn, the elderly, the sick, and to even respect the bodies of those who have died. Secondly, if Jesus was not raised in the body, then what we are teaching about the Eucharist would be wrong. In this sacrament, we profess we're receiving the glorified body and blood of Christ. But if Jesus was not raised in the body, how can, we, how can he be present under the form of bread and wine? What we are receiving under the forms of bread and wine is the risen Jesus in both his divinity and in his humanity. The transformation that occurs in the bread and the wine depends on the truth that Jesus was really raised from the dead in body and spirit. Otherwise, we are receiving an empty symbol. Finally, the resurrection of Jesus' body tells us that he is like us. Yes, he is God. He's one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, but he is also a human being, a man who has a body like we do. He is our human brother in every way. He knows what it means to have pain and to hurt and to suffer. He knows what it means to sweat and to work hard and to be tired. He knows what it means to be weary. He knows what it means to die. And because of this, he is approachable. We can speak to him, and he understands our needs. And because he was raised in the body, he makes it possible for us to experience the same thing. We believe that when Jesus appears to us, to us again at the end of time, our own bodies will rise from the dead. They will be transformed, made new, and after that, we will stand before him body and soul throughout all eternity. <clears throat> we will look upon his face just as surely as you and I are looking upon each other's faces right now. So, the disciples thought they were seeing a ghost. They were wrong. They were seeing the same Jesus that they had known before he died. Only now they were seeing him raised to the life of the resurrection. In a few moments, we're going to say in the creed, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, died, and was buried. He rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Those are not lines from a ghost story. Those are the truth. Jesus is alive, and he will raise us up body and soul to live with him forever. And let us now profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, <coughs> true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Jesus has been raised body and spirit. Let us call upon him in our need, knowing that he hears and answers us. For all who teach the Christian faith, that they may boldly proclaim the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, we pray to the Lord. Lord that the risen Christ may enlighten the minds of all government leaders, enable them to work for true peace and justice for every human being, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our high school students who are preparing to receive the sacraments of the church in these coming weeks may be strengthened in their faith. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the healing power of the recent Jesus may rest upon those who are sick, especially Tom Daly, Terry Jackson, Christina Samano, Matteo Figueroa, and Shirley Bessenfelder. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Stephen Glenn Watson and Dr. Richard O'Reilly, that Christ, who conquered death, may welcome all of our family members and friends into the eternal feast of heaven. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pause to mention our personal petitions in the silence of our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father, you raised your son to new life, and he has promised to do the same for us. Keep us faithful to him, for he is the Lord forever and ever. Amen. As we prepare the gifts for the altar, please join us in singing, I am the bread of life, number 342, number 342. <laughs> Thank you. 
Pray, my friends, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept sacrifice at our hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy. Father, receive these offerings from your church, and as you have given her cause for such great gladness, grant also that the gifts we bring may bear fruit in eternal joy through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and salvation at all times to praise you, Lord. But in this season, above all, to praise you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. He never ceases to offer himself for us, but defends us and ever pleads our cause before you. He is the sacrificial victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever. Therefore, overcome with Easter joy, every land, every people exults in your praise. Even the heavenly powers with the angels and saints sing together the hymn of your glory. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant 
which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of Therefore, Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ's death and resurrection, we offer you the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world, Bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Joseph, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, Saint Elizabeth, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, that we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. We now pray together as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. <coughs> Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, so that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the, the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Peace be with you.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed.
Worthy is the Lamb, number 581, number 581. Worthy God. 
Please take a copy of the bulletin home with you when you leave here today. Immediately following the conclusion of this Mass, Deacon Noel will be available to administer the blessing of a child within the womb. So if you have any expectant parents, please re come up here and sit after Mass. And the rest of us, if we could uh, leave the church in silence so Deacon Noel could celebrate that blessing. Thank you for doing that. Um, let's see, uh, we were going to take a second collection today, but I canceled that for another couple of weeks, okay? So have a, have a coffee on me at Starbucks. <laughs> Be about $10, no, if you think. All right, have a great week, everybody. Let's now stand and close in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, look with kindness upon your people and grant that those you have been pleased to renew by this eternal mystery to attain in their flesh the incorruptible glory of the resurrection through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass ascended. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your lives. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Please join us in singing In Christ Alone, number 415, number 415.